So our, our next panel is going to talk about some of the technical challenges and opportunities of moving to more secure and sustainable energy systems. We've asked Stephen Berberick, the CEO of California's grid operator, to introduce this discussion. And just to make sure we stay accurate, we've also brought Eric Schmidt, who's uh, Director of Operations for the California Independent System Operator. Eric? Um, so Eric is responsible for the minute-by-minute -minute reliability of the grid. And we have the head of our policy and regulatory uh, operations at the ISO, Karen Edson, here as well. You know, all of our societies depend more than ever on electricity now. So it's essential that we manage the transition in ways that keep the system reliable and that minimize costs. California is indeed fortunate to have a leader of the grid who is not only the vision but the technical and managerial skills to help guide this transition. And I can tell you it's a privilege and pleasure to work with him. Please welcome Steve Berberick, CEO of California Independent System Operator. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dave, thank you for the introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, and also, I want to acknowledge Angelina for arranging uh, my opportunity to speak here today. Um, both Dave and Angelina are board members. They're my bosses um, at the California ISO. Let me start with a bit of a background. Some of you may or may not know about our organization. Uh, we're the organization that runs the power grid in California for about 82% of the state, about 35 million people. We're responsible for the four second by four second balancing the system to make sure everyone's reliability is in, in, check. in check. We also run a market. We run a day ahead market and we run a real time market that optimizes the grid every five minutes. We clear about eight and a half billion dollars through the ISO through these transactions. So it's a significant operation. We're, we're a not-for-profit organization. Our goal is to provide the lowest cost, most reliable system. But also, I want to make sure it's clear to everyone in this room, but we also expect, accept the mantle of leadership, support, and expertise for the state's drive we're decarbonizing the electric industry, and we're working very hard on that. I think our presence here today hopefully demonstrates that as well. Should be obvious to most in this room, however many, uh, it's not the case outside of this room, that tectonic changes are underway in the electric industry. I don't think the current industry is going to be recognizable by 2050. The industry paradigm that exists now is one of big generation connected by big transmission, far-flung systems that dump the power onto the distribution system that go to the end consumers. But like other industries, and the examples I'd give you are the booksellers and the phone industry, you don't see many booksellers anymore. You buy your books online. Ten years ago, that wasn't the case. It's changed dramatically in a very short period of time. Many of you in this room no longer have a landline phone. You only use a cell phone. That industry, too, has evolved through technology, and the economics of it has driven it. Similarly, within the electric industry, I think there are some big forces of change at work. I will talk about those forces of change. Then I'll talk about how I see the phases developing. The first force of change, I think, is a strong one, and it's a good one. It's economics. Labor costs are rising for all the utilities. They have higher and higher procurement costs. The transmission and distribution systems are in desperate need of upgrades. When you throw distributed generation and electric vehicles onto the grid, the distribution systems are woefully inadequate to handle that. The current prices are being masked by natural gas. Natural gas is at historic lows, and I don't think we can expect that to continue. At the same time as you heard here today, the costs of distributed technologies are falling, and they're falling dramatically. 
two enabling technologies have to exist for distributed technologies to really grow. First are the distributed technologies themselves. Speaking here in California, solar seems to be the front runner and likely to latch onto it, we have plenty of sun. And indeed, even a state here in California, or in uh, the United States, New Jersey has a high penetration. They don't have any sun in New Jersey. I don't know how many people you've been to uh, New Jersey. And uh, Germany, to all my German friends, I've been there a number of times, and I don't recall getting a sunburn when I was there. But the other technology that has to exist is storage. Storage prices are coming down too, and they're coming down dramatically. When you marry solar with storage, pretty soon you have your own grid. And I believe that's going to drive it. And the economics are going to be powerful. You can now get a grid, or in, I live in PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, they provide power here uh, in our room. My price for power at my home is approximately 34, 35 cents. For most of the power I use, that's the tier four rate. I can get a solar array for 20 cents. Why wouldn't I do that? And indeed, all of my neighbors are. So I think economics will be a big driving force. The second change is going to be the consumers, both big and small. They're going to also drive change. Technologies are emerging that are putting more control in consumers' hands. And the cost of those technologies are falling quickly, too. The impact of customer enablement will be huge. They will be able to see, shape, and control their energy usage. They will have online applications, advanced networking devices, and the transparency of pricing and smart meters. This demand response will gain speed when customers see real-time prices. They have to see feedback. It's a conversation I'll come back to here in a minute. The third thing that's going to drive change, obviously, is climate change. That conversation is growing in urgency as the climate change becomes more and more obvious. But I bring this topic up last for a very important reason, because I think the bigger driver of this is going to be economics. Customers still, in poll after poll, pick economics over climate change. That's not all bad, because if, tech, if environment, if, um, Economics drive it, that's okay. You don't have to convince them otherwise. So economics, the customer, climate change. That's going to drive the change. Let's talk about how the change might occur. The first phase, and I'm proffering that there are three phases to this. The first phase is the model we're in today. It's going to be dominated by a gradual shift of the status quo while new technologies emerge. Central station renewables, backed by conventional generation, will continue to predomin be predominant. I believe the trend will play out over the next decade through 2025 as distributed generation con continues to grow, as costs continue to come down, and storage technologies emerge. The course we need to map during this phase is to use the most efficient clean backup fleet possible and use it only to the extent that renewables aren't available and can't meet demand, such as during morning and evening rants. I also believe that renewables will continue to advance while they can play a role in regulating the system. They can play a role in meeting these ramps. And it's important that this shift from very intermittent and uncontrollable to much less uncontrollable occur. We have to be careful over this next stage. We can't get out in front of the technology or we're going to drive excess costs, and we're going to create reliability problems. EVs, electric vehicles, will also play a big role, and we have to make sure we connect the dots. Phase one, I expect to play out over the next decade through 2025, as I said. Phase two. In phase two, we're going to see some countervailing trends. One of the critical elements of reducing greenhouse gases and cleaning our air is going to be electrification of the transportation fleet. That's going to drive consumption up. So while we're going to be moving it down through energy efficiency, we're going to see a countervailing trend of the transportation fleet being electrified. That means that the continued reliance on central station generation is a bit uncertain. And we'll have to make sure that we get our arms around that as things evolve. 
Though I know those assets, central station generation, central station transmission, is going to become more lightly loaded, but it's likely still to be needed. Also, we're going to have people that will not yet install their own local generation because they may be slow to adopt. Let me give you a factoid. You guys all remember America Online, AOL? They still make something like $750 million a year off dial-up service. Did you know that? It's amazing. Kind of tells you about something about ADAP. So some of these things are going to be around for a bit. Now the gas, natural gas plants that are currently predominating in California can be transitioned to biofuels and biogases and other ways of powering them and away from natural gas. In phase three, the final phase uh, running up to 2050, I think generation will occur predominantly where consumption occurs at the local level. Many, if not most of the homes will be effectively off the grid using storage, their electric vehicles, and their own generation to meet their electric needs. Elements of the grid may still have to exist to handle large customers, electric vehicle fleet charging, etc. The largest consumer of power is likely to be the transportation fleet. By 2020, the energy and production industry will not be entirely carbon free, but will be dramatically more carbon free than today. And the vast majority of demand will be met with renewable and distributed resources. So I've talked about the forces of change. I've talked about the phases. The good news is the technology all exists, but some things have to be taken care of and addressed as we move forward. There are several elements. First, reliability needs to be maintained. Without a reliable system, this train is going to be derailed very fast. So it's important that we connect all the dots. We need to do this thoughtfully and with an eye toward creating a clean and flexible generating fleet. For California, that means we're powering the, the coastal units. Costs. We're going to have to contain costs. That will also derail the path. If a rate bomb goes off, there's going to be hue and cry for a slowdown of the renewables, whether it's their fault or not. So it's important that we watch costs as well. Consumers have got to be empowered. Prices need to be more transparent and immediately visible to customers. Demand is far too inelastic now. Consumers have no immediate feedback on the usage and price, and until that change changes, we're not going to see a lot of consumer participation. Regionalism. Regionalism needs to play a huge role in the use of renewables. The sun doesn't set in California when it does in Utah. The wind doesn't blow in California like it does in Wyoming. It's critical that we harness the portfolio effect of regionalism so that we can clean our environment, not just here in California, but throughout the West. The electric utility model, business model, has to be rethought, and their shareholders need to be made whole. If not, they will fight every step of the way. Finally, let's not forget the laws of physics. The electric system operates at 60 hertz. Voltages to homes and businesses need to be within parameters. Inertia is a very important part of the system. There are indeed few examples in modern history when an entire industry has gone through a complete transformation. To do it right, we need to deepen the collaborative spirit that is emerging among the industries. To do this right, we need to focus on the rare balance between thoughtful environmental stewardship and cost containment. And we'll need to unlock the potential of new technology in the design of the grid to maintain reliability while protecting the environment for our children and for our grandchildren. This really is a special moment in the electric industry the ISO is fully committed to doing it right, and we look forward to working with all of you on this very important endeavor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. I think that kind of phased approach makes the transition manageable, and you've certainly heard that the California grid operator is prepared to help guide that transition. I think we're going to go right ahead.